Welcome everyone to the um, Open Science First Friday sessions of the Global Young Academy. Uh, my name is Steph and I'm one of the co-leads of the working group. Uh, and today we have uh, Eleonora Colangelo. Uh, Dr. Colangelo earned her PhD in uh, classics from the University of Pisa and uh, the Université Paris-Cité and has worked at the Ecole Française d'Athènes, uh, Oxford University and the Fondation Hart. In 2023, she joined Frontiers as an editor um, and outreach specialist, and currently she's an open science policy activist, um, a research integrity trainer, and also an ambassador for Crossref in addition to her work in Frontiers. Um, take it away, Eleonora. Yeah, so thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, uh, as uh, Stephanie kindly uh, already said, I am Eleonora Colangelo and I work as an open science policy analyst at Frontiers, an open access publisher and open science platform based in Switzerland. And besides that, um, I am an ambassador for uh, Crossref. I truly admire the fantastic work the Open Science Working Group at the Global Young Academy is doing, so it's a big privilege to be speaking here. Uh, today, I want to talk about something really, really important, uh, advocating for open science. Uh, specifically, I'll focus on why we need a clear framework to guide open activism from a policy angle. Um, as you can see from this very first slide, my talk is titled From Action to Activism, Open Advocacy in Policy and Practice, and I believe it truly captures the urgency and importance of what we are discussing today. So why is this topic so important? Why do we need to shift from action to activism? Let's kick things off with a quote from Carlos Moedas, the former uh, EU Commissioner for Research and Innovation. Uh, back in uh, 2015, he outlined his vision for Europe, saying we need to be open to the world. Europe is a global leader in science, and this should translate into a leading voice in global debates. Challenges in areas like energy, health, food and water are global challenges and Europe should be leading the way in developing global research partnerships to address these challenges. So what we are seeing here uh, is a clear and urgent call for openness and collaboration in research. Global challenges demand global solutions and science cannot be limited by borders or silos. And as Medas emphasized, simply supporting collaborative projects is not enough. We need to take an active role and foster sustained partnerships across regions and countries. This is where activism really comes in and makes a difference. As advocates of open science, and I think that we are all uh, advocates of open science here, we have witnessed incredible progress driven by community efforts. And these efforts have made for sure research more transparent, accessible, inclusive. But action alone is not enough. We need activism, the push for policy change to lock in these gains and make open science the global standard. And to achieve real, lasting change, we have to combine grassroots action with strong policy advocacy. And Jean-Claude Burgelman, an open science strategist for the European Commission, put it well when he says that open science is more than a policy goal. It is a necessity for the future of research, addressing global challenges that cannot be solved in isolation. I think that really these words capture the earth of today's conversation. Open science is not just about providing access, it's about fostering a global culture of cooperation where uh, research benefits everyone. So as we move forward, we need to think critically about how we can create an environment where open science isn't just an ideal, but the default approach to research and innovation. That's what I focus on in my talk today through this agenda. So first, after this brief introduction, I will explore the framework for activism and the wide range of activities in the open science landscape then I will dive into the open activism and open advocacy aspects in policy. 
discussing various taxonomies and real world practices and what it takes to be considered as uh, an open science activist today. Next, I'll talk about ambassador schemes as a powerful model for uh, developing strong open science activism. And we all specifically look at the Crossref ambassador scheme through a very personal biographical lens. And finally, we'll uh, wrap up with a Q&A session where uh, we can discuss your thoughts and questions, if any. So as we move uh, from setting the stage into the earth of uh, our discussion today, let's talk about the crucial difference between action and activism. Uh, this shift from taking isolated steps to building uh, sustained, coordinated movements is really essential uh, because it mirrors the bigger challenge of bridging the gap between policy and its practical implementation. Uh, from a policy analyst perspective, I found this gap particularly critical in open science, uh, supporting open science principles on paper, like open access data sharing and transparency is one thing, then ensuring these policies translate into meaningful actions is another. And too often we see policies endorsed with enthusiasm but left hanging when it comes to actual execution. And this disconnect between theory and practice is where the real work begins, creating systems, creating networks and tools that make open science a lived reality, not just an ideal. Uh, so activism, as you can see from this slide in open science, is where uh, passionate advocacy meets the practical challenges of turning ideas into reality. And this is where we see the significant difference between action and activism. Because while action is about applying open science principle, activism drives systemic changes in the scholarly communication landscape. For example, as I, as I told uh, earlier, action could be publishing open access papers or making research data publicly av available. Activism, on the other hand, involves engaging broader societal and scholarly communities to all institutions, institutions accountable for their open science commitments. And we see this with several initiatives like Plan Has, this initiative, if we can call Plan S a uh, initiative, of course, is not just about promoting open access as an ideal. It's about making sure open access policies are enforced, monitored, and uh, constantly adapted to meet the evolving needs of research communities worldwide. And since uh, we've been talking about activism for a while, Let's take a quick pause and uh, let's dig into some crucial terms to really understand what we are chatting about. That is the language of doing, the language of action in open science. You might wonder why this focus on language. So in the realm of open science, taking actionable steps is vital. Turning plans into practice to establish open science as the norm is vital. But it's important to think beyond just the term action. How we act profoundly influences how we implement, monitor, and sway these initiatives. Our choices lead to several outcomes impacting the open science landscape both now and in the future. So let's delve into the different ways we can act regarding open science. I will start with the very first fundamental term that is action. Coming from the Latin word axio, which means a doing or setting in motion, action refers to the concrete steps we take to make something, open science in this case, a reality. And this could be researchers openly sharing their data, publishers making the peer review process transparent. These actions are for sure crucial, but they might have end up just being isolated at first, unless they are part of a bigger push for systemic change. Next, there is the, a more intense level of engagement with the second term, actionism. Uh, originating from political and artistic movements in the 20th century, this term describes bold, dramatic gestures aimed at sparking change. 
And in the world of open science, actionism might appear in the form of radical initiatives like, you know, uh, stringent open access mandates or innovative publishing models, something that really challenged the status quo. While these bold moves are often necessary to stir things up, they run the risk of being more symbolic than practical, unless they are rooted in enduring strategies most of time at a national and supranational level. And lastly, we have our word. We come to activism, which has its, its root in the, in the Latin word actus and the French word activism. And it's all about persistent advocacy, okay? In the context of open science, activism means consistently advocating for reforms that transform the research and publishing landscapes to prioritize accessibility, inclusivity, transparency as standard practices. So activism uh, goes beyond just making bold gestures. It involves strategic, sustained actions that collectively influence cultural and policy changes for lasting impact above and beyond someone's working and uh, business environments. So defining the distinct impact of each level, we can definitely see that action uh, focuses on enacting practical changes like open access or promoting data sharing. However, such actions often need supportive policies to really take off. Actionism uh, on the second level excels in drawing attention and sparking change, but it can sometimes end up as just a flashy, short-lived spectacle uh, if it's not backed by a solid long-term vision. And third, activism. Activism pushes for continuous structural reform, addressing deeper challenges, whether that's making publishing more sustainable or ensuring research is uh, linguistically diverse. As we, this, uh, as we tie this up, it's clear that while all the three strategies are forms of action, they each serve uh, a specific purpose because action lays down the immediate steps, you know. Actionism makes the bold declarations and activism finally generates deep, enduring changes in society. So today it's just about for us exploring how this third element, activism, interacts with others to uh, evolve open science from just an ideal to a worldwide standard. Now, uh, let's tackle a question. Is there really such a thing as open science activism today? Uh, to find out, we can do something pretty straightforward. We can simply search for open science activism on Google. And I did this. The results I got were interesting, uh, through perhaps not quite what you'd anticipate. So the first source um, I came across was from the Royal Society. It's an article with a pretty compelling title, Actions Speak Louder Than Words, The Case for Responsible Scientific Activism in an Era of Planetary Emergency. So this article does a good job uh, linking the ideas of action and activism to the bigger picture of open science. However, uh, it uh, didn't go as far as to define what an open science activist is as an official role, an emerging profile in the landscape. Nor, uh, nor does it present open science activism as a distinct mission or set of practices, you know. Activism is definitely part of the conversation here, but it isn't fully embraced as a central uh, element of the open science identity. Uh, next, I came across the interesting article uh, from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I, I open spelling in well. It featured a young, uh, a young hydro uh, hydrological modeler uh, described somewhat amusingly as an advocate for open science. The article is titled Open Science, Activism, uh, and in this piece, the connection between open science and activism is much more uh, explicit. The idea is that choosing to adopt open practices in research naturally leads to activism. In other words, uh, being open is a form of advocacy in itself. 
However, uh, like the previous article, it doesn't dive deeply into what it truly means to be an open science activist. The link is there, but still somewhat undefined. A more promising lead comes from a Libre webinar held uh, two years ago in 2022, titled From Open to Citizen Science to Activism. This event was all about how academic staff can engage in activism through citizen science, pushing for social and environmental justice. And speakers in this webinar basically uh, highlighted the, the Scientist Rebellion Initiative, which for those who don't know this initiative, um, advocates for civil dis uh, disobedience to tackle climate inaction. While this example really put activism uh, uh, in the spotlight, uh, it focused more on science activism in general rather than specifically on open science activism. And moreover, it showed that the concept of activism in science is definitely gaining traction, but it still tends to be researcher centric and often tied up with broader social movements. We start to see a clearer connection uh, with the Central European University Library, which clearly talks about open access activism. Here, activism is directly linked to movements like the Right to Research Coalition with uh, student-led groups worldwide championing access to research as a student right. They also mentioned Spark and Creative Commons, all working to break down barriers in scholarly communication. So it's true that the focus here is mainly on open access. Uh, nevertheless, it's important to remember that open access is a vital part of open science. So this shows that activism is indeed thriving in specific areas of open science, even if the term open science activism in itself is not widely recognized just yet. So after exploring several examples online, why might wonder again, does open science activism really exist? Well, the answer is both yes and no. Let me explain why, uh, because generally activism uh, is most visible in areas tackling climate and social justice issues related to public health and racial or gender equality. However, the open science movement through growing, through growing still has a bit of a niche presence. Think about a couple of terms you've probably heard before, science activism, climate activism. These expressions are much more familiar to most of us uh, and take climate activism for instance, it's a powerhouse of a movement. Immediately groups like um, Extinction Rebellion and inspiring figures like Greta Thunberg come to mind. A quick online search and you'll find endless references and discussions around. But uh, climate activism is not alone. Uh, science activism as well as a whole is broad and tackles critical issues like uh, biodiversity loss and the slow policy shifts toward sustainable development. More and more scientists are stepping out of their labs, joining grassroots movements, taking direct action. It's an exciting, transformative time for science and activism. But now let's look at open science activism. It's clear we are not quite there yet. It doesn't have the widespread recognition that climate activism holds, that science activism holds, but it certainly should. So what's the first lesson we can take from all this discussion? Well, first of all, there's clearly an inadequate theoretical framework around open science activism. It's a term that holds immense power, yet it's still not fully understood or utilized. Uh, there's no systematic use, no systematic definition, no systematic reference to it. But at the same time, let's look at the bright side of things. Uh, while open science activism is not yet a widely recognized term with clear definitions, all the pieces we need to make it a societal reality are already in place. We have the resources, we have the support, we have the enthusiasm. It's just a matter of harnessing all these elements and pushing forward. 
let's get a little bit practical now. Uh, when it comes to action, activism is inseparable from advocacy. And in fact, uh, I would argue that advocacy forms the very foundation of any activist manifesto. If we were to break down activism into different levels uh, from a policy perspective, as I did in this slide, I would place advocacy right at the very first layer. It's all about directly engaging with policymakers and decision makers working to influence their choices, often through lobbying or by submitting evidence-based proposals. As you can see from this slide, uh, within the sphere of open science, there are several remarkable advocacy initiatives. So we can't cover all of them today, but for the sake of clarity, I focus on a few selected examples. First of all, there is Spark. Uh, Spark is a global coalition committed to making openness the default in research and education by advocating for policies that promote open access, open data, and uh, open educational resources. Spark has played a crucial role in legislative changes and created toolkits to help researchers navigate and participate in open science. Next, we have the Foster Project, founded by uh, the European Commission. The Foster Project aims to train and support researchers and institutions in open science practices. They offer an e-learning platform filled with resources to um, help in open science skills development. And if we change continent in Africa, TCC Africa has made significant uh, strides um, in, um, uh, in you know, advocating for open science within the local research community. So through training workshops and events, they focus on increasing research visibility, innovation, impact, demonstrating the tangible benefits of open science. Then you, we have the right to research coalition uh, or R2RC that is another uh, aspiring initiative, a student-led organization championing open access to research. So by raising awareness of the benefits of open science for students and early career researchers, uh, R2RC empowers the next generations to adopt and advocate for open science principle. And lastly, we have uh, Science Commons, a project of creative commons that is dedicated to accelerating and simplifying the sharing of research materials, tools, and data. So all these uh, initiatives are clearly part of a growing global push for open science, offering vital resources, providing policy support, and driving transparency and collaboration in research. But here is the thing. Despite all the progress, despite all this progress, we still don't have a clear structured definition for what open science advocacy or activism really is. And for this reason, you might still be wondering what exactly makes someone an open science activist today? What are the key actions that define this role? I think that sociology offers us some valuable insights here. Because from a uh, sociological standpoint, activism is all about organized efforts by individuals or groups to challenge societal norms, influence public opinion, or push for systemic change. And here, um, we have the key elements of uh, this relatively new profile in the landscape. Uh, you have this on the light side of, um, of the slide. So first of all, we have consciousness. Uh, acti uh, activists need to be aware of an issue or root injustice that demands drastic change in society. Then you have mobilization. Activist works to organize others, raise awareness, share information, and build a coalition of like-minded individuals. Then you have a core key element that is agency. Activist believes that, um, yes, they have the power and responsibility to create change, often through collective action. And then you have collective identity. Activism is often centered around a shared identity or common cause that gather individuals, whether it's public health, 
social justice, or in our case, open science. And then finally, US strategic action. This involves using specific tactics like petitions, lobbying, policy proposals, or public advocacy to drive change. So these principles all together are grounded in the resource mobilization theory in, so in sociology, which highlights the, that activism is about gathering resources, people, knowledge, funding, and organizing them effectively to put pressure on the system and push for change. So now let's look at the right side of this slide. Based on insights from the Open Science MOOC, which emphasizes the importance of open advocacy, we can translate all this into five essential skills that an open science activist needs to have. First of all, a comprehensive understanding, a comprehensive knowledge of open science as a complex system. This means recognizing that open science encompasses a diverse range of stakeholders, from academia to publishing, all operating within interconnected ecosystems that create broad, layered business and societal impact. Then you have a second skill, collaborative volunteering. It's about joining or creating local advocacy groups or meetups. And the focus here is on collective action, often driven by local initiatives to make tangible changes. Third, you have engaging across multiple levels. So effective communication tailored to different types of stakeholders is key. Each group has unique needs and your message as an open science advocate and open science activist should resonate with them accordingly. And then finally, you have negotiation, fourth level, and policy shaping, fifth level. This involves having these skills, uh, the skills to influence and help design policies that will bring about real lasting change in the open science uh, landscape. All this comes together again to create what we can call the open science activist flywheel. So what does an open science activist actually do? Well, here you have the action pillars that open science activists embrace. First, an open science activist advocates for open access. This means pushing for policies and practices that make scientific research freely available to everyone. Next, they promote open data. Open science activists encourage the sharing of data sets, research methods, and results in a way that's transparent and usable for everyone, from fellow researchers to the general public. They also push for transparent peer review. This involves campaigning for a peer review process that's open and transparent, where feedback and evaluations are trustworthy and when possible made publicly available, thus helping to ensure the integrity of research uh, and scientific research. Then uh, supporting open educational resources. Uh, this is another crucial role. Uh, activists work to create, distribute and promote teaching and learning materials that are freely accessible. And this makes educational resources available to a wider audience, breaking down barriers to learning. Then it's also a matter of building a community of practice. It's essential too. Open science activists foster networks of researchers, institutions, and funders who actively support open science principle. And these connections create a supportive ecosystem for open science initiatives. Um, they also have to engage with policymakers, okay? This means getting involved in shaping policies by participating in public consultations, promoting open science policies at uh, influential forums. And their goal, finally, is to embed open science principles into policy frameworks. And lastly, uh, they need to focus on public engagement, involving promoting science literacy, uh, involving um, uh, the public uh, in citizen science projects, which helps to further democratize science. It's about making science accessible and engaging basically for, for uh, everyone. So as you can all guess from this flywheel, uh, to truly be considered an open science activist, you need to act on, more, on multiple levels. 
advocacy policy, engagement, public outreach. And it's this broad, multi-layered approach that really defines what it means to be an open science activist. With this in mind, uh, let's revisit the five skills I mentioned earlier and take a moment to reflect on the first one of the skills on the right side, that is understanding open science as a complex system. So I think that this point is really crucial because adopting a narrow single stakeholder approach is why open advocacy often remains fragmented and underrepresented. For this very reason, I will say that today we don't have a unified open science advocacy movement. Instead, we have advocacy occurring in silos. We have an advocacy for researchers, there is an advocacy for data stewards, for librarians, another one for policymakers, another one for publishers, again, with each group operating independently. So by focusing solely on their own community's needs, they miss the bigger picture. They forget that open science is a collective mission, one where all groups should uh, recognize that the needs of one are the needs of all. So to truly be an open science activist, no matter your job title or work environment here, you need to grasp uh, the complexity across all stakeholder levels. It's important to know what open science means for researchers, librarians, policymakers, research managers, and others all together. But unfortunately, uh, this doesn't happen very often. Usually we find very active advocates focused only on their own interpretation of open science. Take this example on the slide. It's a fantastic article that raises awareness about open access within the academic environment, but as you can immediately grasp from the abstract, its scope is quite limited because it only focuses on the perspectives of researchers and librarians. It leaves out other important viewpoints like those of publishers, which uh, if I may say are often misunderstood. Or take also a look at this other project. This is the pilot action toolkit for open science advocacy, which is part of the Train for EU Plus project led by the University of Warsaw. It's a commendable effort for sure, but mono stakeholder oriented, just focused primarily on librarians, researchers, and certain publishing models, specifically diamond open access while excluding others. And same pattern here in the GISC Open Access Advocacy Toolkit, tailored for librarians and academic staff. Variable efforts, but again, they operate within limited boundaries and fail to encompass the full spectrum of open science stakeholders. These are just a few examples, okay? And the list could be even longer. What really matters here now is the second lesson we have learned from all this talk about advocacy and activism. First of all, uh, we learned that we need to start linking the word activism more directly to open science, especially right from the very uh, right from the beginning at the policy making stage. This simple shift in language could be enough to ignite the systemic changes we are aiming for. And you might be wondering again, why this focus again on language? Well, let me explain why this is so important. And sociology, again, um, is very important. Sociology tells us that throughout history, creating circles of activism is vital for building ownership and collective awareness around a cause. So when people unite around a shared goal, it not only fosters a sense of belonging, but also strengthens their commitment to the cause. In social movement theory, researchers like Benford and Snow refer to this as collective framing. This is the process where activists create a shared narrative, a frame that helps people connect with the movement itself. And this is crucial because when people identify with a cause, they are more likely to stay engaged and push for long-term change. 
And research supports this too, because studies show that activism is most effective when it builds a strong sense of weness, a shared identity. And if you think about this, this collective approach has been essential in movements like climate activism, bringing together communities and organizations to drive real change. So from a sociological perspective, we cannot underestimate the power of bold language. How we talk about activism could be the catalyst for systemic change. Do you want more concrete, real, open science activism? Well, just call it by name and open science activism will become a powerful witness example in the history of knowledge. Now, uh, let's ask a second crucial question. Is activism really considered from, you know, the start of policy making? I think the answer is not yet. Earlier, we mentioned that open science activism is starting to gain momentum, but it's still not a widely recognized term. And when you compare it to something like climate activism, which is well known and spans various sectors, open science advocacy is still very much confined to academic and research circles. And this is reflected at several levels in policy, taxonomy and literature. Let's start with uh, policy. OK. Um, right now, when it comes to policies, whether at the institutional or national level, there's something important missing. Open science advocates and advocacy aren't yet recognized as a unified force, and we don't have a clear way to measure how successful open science advocacy practices really are in any given setting. But there's hope, even though open science advocacy hasn't uh, been fully formalized in national or international policies yet, UNESCO's recommendations on open science provide a strong foundation for this. Take um, the building capacity for open science toolkit, for example. One key element that often gets overlooked in policy discussions is awareness building. Advocacy is a powerful way to meet that need, even though you won't always find it explicitly mentioned. And that's where UNESCO's toolkit steps in. It highlights essential factors like building human capacity for open science, supporting the cultural shifts needed for its progress and guiding organizations through these changes. So the hope here is that starting with these recommendations, we'll see a more systematic effort to define open science advocacy at a policy level. And by formalizing it, we can create a real framework that drives progress in open science. And that's where to change happens. So this is what we can observe on a policy level. OK, let's talk now about taxonomies for a while. Is open advocacy or open science activism recognized there? Let me show you the situation right now through the lens of the Foster diagram. Uh, for those who don't know it, this comes from the Foster project I mentioned before. Um, this diagram is supposed to map out all the key aspects of open science, policies, open research, open access, open evaluation, and open metrics. But here's the catch. If you look for terms like open advocacy, open science advocacy, or open science activism, you won't find them. They are simply not there. And that's not an accident. As we have discussed before, there's a glaring gap in recognizing the role of advocacy in these conversations. So if we want to create large scale change and mobilize people globally, these terms need to be part of the equation. So taking a closer look at the diagram, we see key pillars for sure open access, we see open research, open evaluation, and they are all crucial for sure. But without open advocacy, we are missing the engine that drives engagement and action. Advocacy is really what brings these pillars together and turns them from abstract ideals into real actionable movements. So if we are serious about building a global open science movement, 
open advocacy has to be visible, has to be recognized as a part of the conversation and needs to be measurable. It's time for advocacy really to stop being the missing piece in these taxonomies. And it's not just a matter of diagrams because this absence extends to academic literature as well. There is, this is a fantastic article I would recommend called When Will Open Science Become Simply Science by Mick Watson, published back in the 2015 in Genome Biology. So here Watson talks about six pillars of open science, open data, open access, open methodology, open source, open peer review, and open education. It's an inspiring piece that lays out the foundations. We all agree about this, but here's the thing. It doesn't mention open advocacy or activism either. And that's the problem. Without acknowledging advocacy, we are leaving out the force that makes open science not just a set of practices, but a true movement. Okay, so far uh, we have delved into the idea of open science activism. We have explored its different layers, how using clear and accessible language, uh, how this can spark real change in behavior and what it takes to be an open science activist, right? We've also seen how open activism it's still largely overlooked uh, and that it's the missing piece, you know, in a puzzle that's supposed to drive open science forward. But now let's make a shift. Let's move from the abstract to the practical. How do we actually build a thriving community of open science advocates or activists? One of the most effective strategies we can tap into is ambassadorship. Ambassadorship offers a tangible, actionable first step toward creating a global network of open science champions. It's a strategy that lays the groundwork for lasting, impactful change. Ambassadorship, as you can see from this slide, can be a game-changing strategy in advancing open science activism for several reasons. It provides a platform for individuals and institutions to champion open science principle, bridging, uh, principles, bridging the gap between lofty policies and the real-world action needed to implement them. And more importantly, it can help build global networks of advocates who are working towards the same goal. So in just a few words, I will say that ambassadorship can become the engine that drives change, helping to translate big ideas into practical step. But why is ambassadorship such an effective framework for open science activism? Because it uh, brings the big picture vision of open science down to the grassroots level. Ambassadors are the connectors. They breach the high-level policies with the day-to-day -day needs of researchers, helping to bring about real change in our science system. And uh, plus, ambassadors don't just promote open science, okay? They are actively working within their institutions, within their business environments and organizations to lead by example. They share critical knowledge, they share tools, best practices, of building a network of informed and empowered advocates who can initiate real change from the inside. So I will say that ambassadors are the driving force behind the behavioral shifts necessary to make open science uh, the standard. And this is where the distinction between act activists and ambassadors uh, becomes clear. Because activists push for sweeping systemic changes, often from outside the system through grassroots movements and public campaigns, while ambassadors, on the other hand, operate within formal structures. They are completely embedded in institutions and business environments. Now, uh, let's take a look at some key ambassadorship programs that are really making a difference right now. Uh, first of all, we have the Crossref Ambassador Program. As you already may know, Crossref is all about providing metadata, which are essential for tracking and discovering research outputs. Uh, basically, uh, ambassadors in this program promote the use of metadata in scholarly communication, which helps ensure accurate citations and greater transparency. 
Then you have the Center for Open Science or COS Ambassador Program. Uh, COS focuses on promoting openness, integrity in, in scientific research. And their ambassadors basically introduce tools like the Open Science Framework or OSF and uh, lead workshops that teach researchers how to share their data and methodologies openly. And finally, we have the king of ambassador schemes, I will say. We have the DOA J ambassador scheme or the directory of open access journals ambassador scheme. For those who are not aware, DOAJ is a big index of quality open access journals across all fields. So basically, ambassadors uh, for DOAJ promote ethical publishing practices, helping researchers make their work freely accessible. They raise awareness about how open access publishing can be both rigorous and valuable, especially on journal management best practices level. So, yes, they ensure basically that more people see the benefits of sharing their research openly um, on a really scholarly publishing level. So, yes, these are the programs that are more playing uh, a critical role in building a culture of openness in science mm -hmm. and uh, research. And then ambassadors are leading the way in driving uh, this important change. Uh, before diving into just a little bit before the specifics of Crossref, uh, I, I'm almost at the end of my talk. Uh, let's focus on three core activities that ambassadors engage in, all of which are closely tied to open science activism. First of all, uh, building global networks. Ambassadors don't just work in isolation. They create networks of experts and advocates who share the best practices across countries disciplines and institutions. So these networks amplify local initiatives, turning small efforts into something much larger, pushing open science activism into a global stage. Second, providing training and resources. Ambassadors often lead workshops, webinars, and forums. So they offer crucial resources to communities that might not have access to formal training in open science. And third, leading by example. Many ambassadors are pioneers in using open practices in their own, in, in their own research and workplaces. By sharing uh, their own success stories and showing the transparency of their workflows, they help reduce skepticism and build trust in open science. So their leadership really inspires others to follow and embrace open practices. So these are the pillars of what ambassadors do and how they are making real progress in advancing open science. And this leads uh, to something very close to my heart, the Crossref ambassadorship, a role I'm, pr I'm proud to hold for Europe. So Crossref ambassadors are trusted contacts embedded within diverse communities. Uh, they are librarians, researchers, publishers, societies and tech innovators around the world. Uh, also science editors and research managers, of, co uh, of course. Uh, and these individuals share a passion for Crossref's mission and alongside their professional roles, they volunteer to support their local scholarly communities. So they host workshops, facilitate discussions and provide training, all while serving as Crossref's highs and ears in the field. Uh, but uh, now, um, uh, Yes, so now what we have explored, uh, now that we have explored how ambassadorship can drive uh, open science activism and take a closer look at the Crossref Ambassador Program from my own experience, uh, let's address a key question. Why is the Crossref Ambassador Program so critical for open science? Uh, so to understand this, we first need to look at how Crossref plays a crucial role in making research more discoverable and uh, accessible. So as I said earlier, Crossref is not just a behind the scenes player, it's a dri driving force for uh, connecting researchers and institutions and research outputs, accelerating discoveries and 
enabling the sharing of knowledge on a global scale. So by providing access to metadata from millions of research articles, Crossref empowers scholars to build on each other's work more efficiently. And here's a prime example that is worth being reminded still today, still uh, now in 2024. Back in June 2020, Crossref released a massive data set of over 100 million records to help accelerate the vaccine research during the pandemic. That's the kind of immediate impact Crossref can make, okay? But there is more because Crossref has officially adopted the POSI or POSI, the Principles of Open Scholarly Infrastructure. Uh, so these principles basically were created to ensure that organizations committed to open infrastructure remain transparent, sustainable, and community-driven. So Crossref now follows 16 commitments under policy, reinforcing its dedication to open access and supporting the global research uh, community. So that being said, it's easy now to connect the dots between Crossref and the broader open science movement, because we know that open science is all about making research and data freely accessible, available to everyone. And many researchers are eager to adopt this principle, but often ask, how do we get there? So that's where Crossref steps in, and it's why uh, the Crossref Ambassador Program is so powerful. Ambassadors work directly with their communities to show how Crossref tools can streamline the research process and break down barriers to access. A uh, last uh, mention, a last slide uh, on how does Crossref pra practically support open science, okay? So Crossref members register metadata that helps research flow more freely. So this metadata uh, is not just for basic citations, it's rich interconnected data that can be integrated into the tools and databases researchers rely on every day. So in other words, Crossref helps ensure that research doesn't just sit on a shelf, but reaches the people who need it when they need it. And um, Crossref uh, provides key identifiers, um, DOIs for articles, archives for authors, uh, RORs for institutions, and so on. And these identifiers are like the glue that holds the, ent the entire research ecosystem together, making it easier to track and link research across the world. And this is what Crossref calls the research nexus. You have here in this slide, um, in the second image, um, a scheme uh, of this research nexus where everything is interconnected, speeding up the pace of discovery. And let's not forget that sharing and citing data is really fundamental today to transparency and reproducibility in research. Crossref supports this by enabling data citations, preprints, and peer reviews to be registered as part of the scholarly record so that researchers get the recognition they deserve for all aspects of their contributions. So in short, as you can see, Crossref is actively working to support open science, drawing on a diverse network of experts, librarians, researchers, publishers, compliance managers, policy analysts like myself and so on from all corners of the globe. And if you are curious to learn more, I encourage you to explore our blog at crossref.org slash blog. And if you have any questions, feel free also to reach out at feedback uh, at crossref.org or join the conversation on our community forum at community.crossref.org. So let's really keep the conversation going. going. And that brings us to the end of my talk. Uh, we have explored a wide range of topics today from sociology and taxonomies to practical, um, to practical approaches in open science activism. I know that lots of information and suggestions are there. So if you are interested in revisiting any of uh, the key points, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to share more uh, insights uh, with you. And also, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to discuss. Uh, thank you very much for your time, for your attention, and uh, most of all, for your patience.
Thank you very much for the talk.